Okay, wonderful. Are you glad you're a Christian? Yeah. Amen. Are you glad that Jesus Christ came to set you free? Yeah. Amen. It's a good time. I'm glad to have you guys here. Welcome to all of you. Um, you know that uh, God put women in this world to civilize us. And they are not here tonight. So we don't necessarily have to be civilized, and we're going to shout to the Lord. Amen? Amen. God's good. Uh, I just want to have a little, a little time of thanking everybody for coming, welcoming you. Uh, we couldn't do it the last year or two because of the whole COVID thing shut down, and we're excited to be back here together again with a bunch of men, celebrating the idea of being men and the whole idea of being arrested by destiny. Arrested by destiny. I just want to take a, couple, a little bit of time here for a couple of thoughts to kind of go back to where we were in one of the earlier ones. Welcoming you, of course, to this event and thinking about kingdom masculinity. What is masculinity? What is it? What is a man? What does it mean to be a man? Manhood today is under attack we hear these terms toxic masculinity. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. Amen. And in the garden, he put a man and a thank you. And to the man and the woman, he said, I am going to give you dominion. Satan thinks that if he could erase the idea of man, and erase the idea of woman, and merge them all into shims, there would be no dominion. So, of course, manhood's under attack. You need to change and learn to be a nice girl. Yeah, well, how's that going for you? <laughs> God made you good. I understand that there is sin. I understand there's mistakes and imperfections, but God made you good. And I just want to emphasize a couple of these things here tonight. God made you good, and the kingdom needs you. God made you good, and the kingdom needs you. I understand that sin messed things up, but God made you good, and the kingdom needs you. The kingdom needs you as you were made a wild and untamed man. I don't suppose I need to point out that Jezebel needs you as a eunuch. And I would rather be a kingdom man than a Jezebel eunuch. Can somebody at least say amen? God, the Lord God took man and put him in the Garden of Eden to dress it and keep it. God made you good. <clears throat> sin twists and distorts things. You must believe that what God made is good. Somehow down inside of you, you need to start to believe that the way that God made you as a man is good. And so part of what we're doing this weekend is just celebrating this whole idea of men getting together and saying, okay, we may not be the best smelling, nicest looking things in the whole creation, but God made us for a purpose Amen. And what he made is good. Amen. And we have a purpose. Amen. And that purpose is in the kingdom. Can I hear a hallelujah? hallelujah. Amen. True manhood is defined by its willingness to suffer for those who cannot defend themselves. Who was the ultimate man? Oh, shout it. Who was the ultimate man? And what did he do? He gave his life. He suffered for those of us who had absolutely no defense. Amen? He suffered for those of us who could not defend ourselves. Manhood is defined by its willingness to suffer for those who cannot defend themselves. So this is just kind of some of the things 
here at the beginning that I wanted you to think about. And then we're going to go into this part about arrested by destiny. I want to go to Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That would be Jesus Christ. Amen. And the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable to his death, if by any mean I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead. <laughs> Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for all that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Next verse says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. So now I'm going to back up and go back to this verse. Arrested. Arrested by destiny. The word arrest here is the word apprehend. Paul says, I was going down the road one day on my donkey, just making time, heading for Damascus. And all of a sudden, something came running up behind me, grabbed me, knocked me off my donkey, and sat on me. I was arrested. If somebody's robbing a bank and they're running down the street trying to get away and the policeman's running after him, and he grabs them and tackles them and grabs his, you know, his... Uh, handcuffs and he handcuffs their hand behind their back it will say the person was apprehended on queen street you follow what i'm saying apprehend is arrested paul said i was arrested and then he says another interesting thing there is a reason i was apprehended i don't know what that reason is but one day one day, I will see that reason riding down the road in a donkey. And I will run up behind that reason, and I will grab that thing off its donkey and slap it on the ground, and I will sit on it. And I will arrest the reason for which I was arrested. I don't have time to put a whole bunch of these caveats in here, but this one is just too good. You know who wrote this? You know who wrote that? Why do you think God arrested Paul? What do you think the main assignment that God had was for Paul? To write most of the New Testament. Paul's sitting here saying, someday I'm going to get a hold of the reason. He was doing it, people. He was doing it and didn't know it. That's rich. And then he says, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended. <laughs> I'm not convinced I found the reason yet. But I am ready to ditch the things behind and go galloping down the road looking for it. And someday I'm going to find it. And I'm going to pull that thing down off his donkey and sit on it. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. I, I just, I would love to go into a whole bunch of this in Acts chapter 9. Um, uh, Paul is, is going down the road. I'm, I'm just, I'm going to turn there. If you have your Bible and you want to look at it, you can look at it. But Paul's going down the road to Damascus. And I think that we, we lose track of stuff. Um, uh, if you have a, if you, if you like understanding what you're reading when you read the Bible, I have an idea for you. If you have a pen, you might want to write this down. Um, there is a book called Revolutionary Bible Study. And this book will take you through the book of Acts and show you where everything happened, where every book was written, what happened in between, who the kings were, who the princes were, and everything. It's, it's a pretty thick book. It's called Revolutionary Bible Studies. It's absolutely fantastic. But anyway, um, do you know, it, it, was, it was approximately five years after Jesus Christ resurrected and ascended before this takes place in Acts chapter 9. Saul is yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples. And he went to the high priest and got letters to go to Damascus. So he's going down the road toward Damascus. It doesn't say he was on a donkey, but he's journeyed. He came near Damascus and suddenly there shined around about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick 
against the pricks. And when he got up off the ground, he was blind. And they led him into the city. And he's wandering around in the city. <laughs> and he's trying to find his way in there in the city. And uh, God tells him to go to one, one guy's house named Ananias on a street that is called Straight. Now, here's another caveat. That street called Straight is still there. And it still has a sign on it that says Straight Street. And the same stones are on the street that were there then. And if you go on that street and ask somebody where Ananias' house is, it's right over there. I'm not going to Damascus next, not next month, but I'm going to Lebanon, a country right behind it, right beside it, Lord willing. And I am looking for six young people to go along. If anybody knows any that want to go, let me know. I'm assuming that most of us will come back alive. Okay. So he goes to Ananias' house. They, they pray for him. The, the scales fall off and all that. And you kind of know that, that story. Well, Saul goes out and he begins to preach. It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. Paul goes out and he begins to preach. And I don't know how familiar you are with this story, but I think it would be good for you to be familiar with it because Paul goes out there and begins to preach. As soon as the scales are off his eyes, he goes out there and starts preaching. I mean, he is preaching up a storm. He goes to one town and he, he can tell. Wow. This is Jewish culture, okay? They would go to the schools and they would find the smartest person in each school and they would send them to the city. And they would put them in the smart school. And they would pull the smartest people out of the smart school and send them to Jerusalem, to the smart, smart school. And then they would take a handful of people out of the smart, smart school and they would bring those people directly to the high priest and he would learn at their feet. That was the smart, smart, smart school. When Paul says, I learned at the feet of Gamaliel, he is saying, I was the smart, smart, smart one. He's out there. He's so smart. Nobody can argue with him. He knows most of the first five books of the Bible by memory. Nobody can argue with him. So when he gets in the synagogue and he starts arguing, everybody just gets mad. So finally one time a bunch of people came around. We're going to kill him. And the other Christians took him out and let him down over the wall in a basket and said, you need to leave. And then some of them got around him and they took him out to a ship and they put him on a ship that was going as far away as possible. You know what the Bible said? And Paul disappeared, by the way. At that point, Paul disappeared. We don't know how long he disappeared. It was at least three years, possibly as long as 12. He is absent from the pages of Scripture. And you know what God recorded during that time? Then had the churches rest. Ouch. There's destiny for you. Then had the churches rest. Wow. Well, you know the rest of the story. But see, he didn't then. And when he came back, it was different, wasn't it? When he came back, when he started teaching 12 years later or whatever it was, and he began to teach with Barnabas, the people were called Christians first in that place where he was teaching. And then they got together and they said, you guys need to go out here and do what you're doing. And they went out and started evangelizing and they're going all over the place and they're setting up churches and all this. Now, I want to show you today the first verse that is written in the New Testament. It's right there. Galatians 1.1. 1, 1. First book in the New Testament that was written was Galatians. And there's the first verse. And it says, Paul, an apostle, not of man, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. The first verse in the New Testament that was written says, 
I have a destiny and it was decided by God. And my friend, you have a destiny that was decided by God. You do not get to choose your destiny. God does that. You get to choose what you want to do with it. Between the arrest and the destiny was a desert time. Young people come to me all the time and say, well, I want to know what my calling is. I want to know what my destiny is. Find a desert. When it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace to reveal his son in me, I preached him among the heathen immediately. I conferred not with, with flesh and blood. And he goes on and talks about that. I'm going to leave that there because I don't want to get out of my time frame. Here's something I want you to think about. The knowledge of your destiny does not mean you are ready for it. It means it is ready for you. And somewhere we have to allow God to form us into what he wants so we can walk into the destiny that he has for us. Amen? We're going to hear a whole bunch of things this weekend from people, different people, because we have a bunch of, you know, we, we, I want this to, re to reinforce this in your mind again. God made you good. The kingdom needs you. And the kingdom needs you as you were made a wild, untamed man. I really, really believe that. We're going to hear this week some stories and, and about men of velvet and steel. We're going to hear some stories about men who were going the wrong way on their donkey and God arrested them and pulled them off and slapped them down in their face. Amen. And he said, you're going the wrong way and I'm going to arrest you because I have a destiny for you. He pulled the scales off their eyes. But I want to tell you something else. You do not know how much those men suffered between their arrest and their destiny. And they're going to be talking about some of that this week. And I just, I'm praying for it. I'm hoping that it is a, a blessing. You are called to be a man and your destiny is is to serve others. But in what way and what capacity? Amen? What is your destiny? I'm assuming today that most of you are here because God knocked you off your donkey at some point. Maybe some of you are still riding your donkey. I don't know. If, it, if you are, then I hope he knocks you off this weekend. Amen? Because Paul was religious. He had all the religion down. He was very clear in Philippians 3. He said, if you want to give a religious pedigree, I got a better one. But I still had to be knocked off my donkey. So what's your destiny? Behind every face is a story. And in front of every face is a destiny. What's yours? What's yours? I don't know if Paul ever understood. I believe personally that Paul died a martyr, walked off the edge, at the edge of the earth and off the pages of time and never knew what his destiny was. But he felt it, didn't he? It's not important for you to know the details. It is important for you to hear and do. We got a break time for about 15 minutes. Um, over through these double doors, there's a hallway. You can go around either way, but through the door, double doors, the hallway, there's restrooms there. And then if you go to the right just a little bit and look in there, there's a kitchen, there's coffee and water in there. We are actually allowed to bring cups in here of coffee if we want to. They don't care if we bring coffee in the room. 
So you're you're welcome to bring coffee back in here. Try to be in here at what is it? Twenty till. Seven forty. Yeah. So twenty till. Try and get in. When you hear singing, come. And Ron, my friend, is going to come up here and tell you a story about how he was riding his donkey the wrong direction and God nailed him. Amen? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, you can go have a break then.